We're continuing our studies in Chapter 1 on the Chemical Basis of Life, and our subject in this lesson is Energy and Metabolism in Biological Systems. Recall that one of our ongoing themes in this course is the study of thermodynamics. It is the study of heat or energy, that's the thermo part, and power or dynamics. In other words, how can we use energy to carry out our biological work? Recall that the first law of thermodynamics states that energy can neither be created or destroyed. All we can do is convert it from one form to another. Since all living organisms must obey the laws of thermodynamics, it becomes important for us to, to understand the principles behind these laws and how they cooperate in the functioning of these biochemical systems. At the top of our slide is the most common expression for the Gibbs free energy of a system. As we proceed in the course, you will see other expressions that relate to the Gibbs free energy, and these can vary depending on the components involved in the system, but this is the most general and most common form. <coughs> You'll notice that there are delta symbols in our expression, indicating a value that represents a change in that component. The expression is equally valid without the delta symbols, but in that case they would be absolute values. Since we don't have a way of determining these absolute values, instead we measure the change or delta value. In this expression, G stands for the Gibbs free energy in units of joules per mole and represents that portion of an energy change, the delta H, that is available or free to do work hence the name, the Gibbs free energy. H is the symbol for enthalpy, also in units of joules per mole, and it is a measure of the total energy or heat content of the system. The higher this value, the greater the energy change. A negative change indicates that heat is released, whereas a positive change indicates heat is absorbed. The entropy of the system is indicated by the letter S and is in units of joules per Kelvin moles. It is a measure of the disorder or randomness of the system. Or perhaps a better way of expressing it is that it indicates how the energy is dispersed. The more positive the change in entropy, the more the energy is dispersed. You'll notice that the entropy component is modified by the temperature, or T, in Kelvin. So as the temperature increases, so does the randomness of the system. That is, it's harder for the molecules or groups to stay together. Looking again at our expression, it tells us that the amount of energy available to do work, the delta G, is determined by the total energy content of the system, delta H, minus the entropy component, T delta S. Let's look a little bit more closely at this concept of entropy. At the top of our slide, we have a photograph of a student desk that represents a high state of disorder. This would represent high entropy, whereas the desk on the lower left has greater order, and that means lower entropy. So if we took the desk at the top, and organized it to look more like the one at the bottom, this would represent a negative change in entropy, creating more order. Perhaps a better illustration is the one from your book on the lower right. On the left of the figure, the billiard balls are highly ordered, representing low entropy. However, once the cue ball strikes the rack, they scatter in every direction thereby dispersing the energy and creating a condition of high entropy. This would represent a positive change in entropy, a condition of greater disorder, or perhaps another way, another way of stating it, a greater freedom of movement. You'll want to keep in mind that these delta values, like the delta G, represent a change in conditions. In the case of delta G, it's the final Gibbs free energy of the system minus that of the initial. If it is a chemical reaction, then it is the Gibbs free energy of the products minus that of the reactants. This tells us that if the value of delta G is positive, it means the final energy of the system is higher than the initial, 
and therefore we had to put energy into the system. This means the reaction cost us energy and it is therefore endergonic or non-spontaneous. On the other hand, if the delta G value is negative, it means that energy was released by the system and that means the reaction is exergonic or spontaneous. A good analogy is to consider rolling a ball uphill. It cannot go up the hill on its own. We have to put energy in the system to make that happen. That is, it's non-spontaneous. On the other hand, the ball can roll down the hill very easily, spontaneously, because it represents the release of energy. You'll also want to note that the expression for delta G relates to the equilibrium of the system, not to kinetics or movement. In other words, it tells us how likely it is to occur, but not how fast it will occur. You'll also want to note that if delta G is zero, then the system is at equilibrium. There was no energy change. Keep in mind, a living system is never at equilibrium. That would suggest no net energy coming in and none going out. So let's look at what makes life possible from a thermodynamic perspective. Remember, our expression tells us that if there is a large unfavorable change in entropy, a negative change, this would result in a positive change in delta G indicating that the change is not favored, it's not spontaneous. Life, of course, is all about creating order, and that does mean a large negative change in entropy. And therefore, it would suggest that conditions are not favorable to life. How then can we make life spontaneous or favorable? Our expression tells us that if we create order, we must also release or expend energy, the delta H component. This is why we need metabolic processes to release the energy that we can then use to create this order. Of course, the more complex the organism, the greater the order and therefore the greater the energy needs. Remember, if there is no energy change, if delta G is zero, no life exists. So instead, therefore, of striving for equilibrium, an organism works towards homeostasis, literally meaning similar standing still. We want to maintain a stable set of conditions like pH and temperature. In other words, we want a stable condition of non-equilibrium where the net change in the Gibbs free energy is less than zero. One of the ways we can make an unfavorable reaction occur is to couple it with one that is favorable. As illustrated in our figure, the reaction on the left that converts reactant A to product B is unfavorable. The delta G value is a positive 15 kilojoules per mole. However, the reaction on the right, which converts reactant B to product C, is highly favorable releasing 20 kilojoules per mole of energy. So if we couple these two reactions, then we sum the values of delta G, making the conversion of A to B and then to C favorable overall, with the net delta G of negative 5 kilojoules per mole. We'll find that many cellular reactions are coupled in this way. Coupling occurs if the two reactions happen either simultaneously or in rapid succession. This is especially common in metabolic pathways. Most of the metabolic pathways that we'll consider are generally a series of oxidation reduction or reduction reactions. So you'll want to become familiar and comfortable with how to recognize if a carbon compound is being oxidized or reduced. Remember the acronym OIL RIG. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain with regard to electrons. In other words, electrons are transferred from the molecule or group being oxidized and to the group being reduced. 
They're called redox reactions because if there is an oxidation, there must also be a reduction. Metabolism is really all about moving electrons around. In our figure, in the center of the slide, plants can use the energy of sunlight to reduce carbon dioxide to a carbon compound like glucose. We can then take the carbohydrate produced by the plant and oxidize it back to CO2, thereby releasing energy that we can then use for cellular processes. Metabolic reactions are always carried out by enzymes, which we'll examine in more detail in chapters 6 and 7. In our next video lesson, we want to look at the three domains of life. How are they classified and what are their characteristics?